everybody. How are you? You know, when we first started, there was like four of you in here. And I thought, well, that's all right. But I'm surprised. So congratulations, you made it to church. Hey, if you're joining us online, good morning. We're glad you are there. Francie's hosting you this morning, so we know you're having a great time. We are starting a brand new series this week. It'll be just a two-week series. Um, We're going to be talking about something that's kind of important. Um, It might not seem like a big deal, but loving where you live and loving your neighbors can actually kind of be hard sometimes. Anyone else? Yes, sometimes it's hard to love those closest to us. Um, It's kind of significant, though, because in a season where we have had, especially the last few years, some difficult times happening in our community, in our world. You know, we've got masks and limited gatherings and illness concerns and economic uncertainty. And so right now is a good time to kind of focus in on loving where you live because it's kind of the most basic and perhaps most impactful way to demonstrate the love of Jesus to others. So the events and restrictions of the last couple years have limited our travel to almost every area of the world, right? For a while, we were shut down completely. And I remember at our former church in Medford, we were getting ready to have a team go out to another country, like right as it closed down. Um, And so that was rough, right? Everybody was used to being able to go out and, and travel abroad and share the love of Jesus. And all of a sudden, we were stuck. And so sometimes it's easy to kind of look overlook where we live. It's easy to overlook the fact that our neighbors are just as important as the people across the globe. So it might not seem like this deep theological message this week, but it's really important, and it's, it's something that I think we, it's a good way to end one year and a good way to start a new year with remembering this. So before we get going, let's go ahead and pray together. God, thank you so much for meeting us here this morning, for bringing those to the building here safely. And I just pray that you would speak to us this morning, that we would lean into what you have to say for us in your name. Amen. Did anybody else experience like a surge of neighborly kindness at the beginning of the pandemic? Anybody else? Like, yeah. So we um, had our neighbors, like we lived in a great little neighborhood and we'd been there for several years and everyone was friendly. But once this happened, people kind of started popping out of the woodwork, like, we exchanged neighbors, and our, we had a widow that lived next door to us, and she brought flowers, and we talked like, hey, if you guys need anything, let us know. And, and we actually had some of our best friends did a drive-by, and they, they brought signs, and they had like a dance party, and it says, um, loved, you are, it's Yoda. Um, we're in this together. I'll never take hugs for granted again. Like right at the beginning, they did this, and they drove through a bunch of their friends' neighborhoods, and it was like this, yeah, like, we're in this together. We got this, right? Um, Our neighbors next door, um, I started chemo, and they brought over Lysol and uh, hand sanitizer, and he worked at Costco, so he brought us, you know, elusive toilet paper and things like that, and it was really great, like, hey, we're in this together. We've got this. This is awesome. It was kind of a wake-up call, like, oh, wow, we are neighbors, and we really should be taking care of each other. It wasn't like we weren't not friendly, but it kind of changed our perspective on things and how important stuff really was. So the next two weeks, we're going to be talking through what it looks like to be a good neighbor and what that means and how do we prepare our hearts to move towards people. And I feel like this is, like I said, a great message to just kind of end out the year and maybe take an assessment, like, how did I do this last year in this and how can I do better moving forward? So we're going to talk through um, this passage where Jewish leaders in this day, they really wanted to catch Jesus in um, some—they wanted to catch him, right? They they were looking for reasons to, to get rid of him and to get him in trouble. And so they often argued about what law was most important. And in my mind, I'm just picturing my kids arguing about things. like So I just picture these Jewish leaders. They're kind of immature in my mind. Like, well, tell us what's the most important or tell me what is the best thing to do because I want to get it right and I want to be the most important. And they really, their whole goal was to be really religious. They felt like that was the peak, right? So they were looking for anything that they could do to be the most religious. And so this passage that, I'm gonna, that we're going to look at is actually a lawyer is asking Jesus, well, what law is the most important? And Jesus, um, 
he wants Jesus to pick a side, right? He wants to know that he's on the right side and, and Jesus is on his side. And so Jesus does say what the most important thing is, but he actually then explains how to go about it. So let's, let's take a look. Matthew twenty two thirty 30 through 40. There we go. Um, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, when Jesus had silenced them, they came together. And one of them, an expert in the law, asked a question to test him. Teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? He said to them, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. So a little review, but an important one. We've been given two powerful commands as Christians. First is the Great Commission, right? To go and make disciples. And the second is the Great Commandment, which is to love God and love people. So what does it actually look like to love your neighbor? Perhaps it's simple, but sometimes I think we either overcomplicate it or we make it so simple that we ignore it. There seems to be, it's hard for us to kind of find a happy medium. So um, it's just important for us to, to kind of focus in on what that means. So there's two principles that I think can help us when we're thinking about what it looks like to actually play this out. So the first is the proximity principle. We actually say a lot around here that everything changes when it's someone you know, right? Well, how do we know people? We have to get close to them. We actually have to be proximate to people. Sometimes it's easier to love on people that are not close to us. So why is it that when we go on a mission trip, we can really focus in and love other people? But man, if it's my neighbor, (laughs) that dog just pooped in my yard, it's really hard to love those people. And I think it's because when you take a mission trip or you go someplace specific, you've blocked out that time. You're on, you have vacation time, you are gone for a week, there are no other distractions. That is your whole purpose, is to be there and to serve and love people. But when we're at home, we have work and we have school and we have obligations and we're just trying to get from one place to the next and when somebody does something that we don't like, it's just annoying. We don't have the same kind of focus. So we don't focus in on tightly on that one person or the fact that you know, they need to be loved too. And you can see everybody as your neighbor and that's important, but we can't forget our actual neighbors. So yes, we want to love everybody and show the love of Christ with everybody, but we cannot forget our neighbors when we do that. Or our actual desk mate or cube mate, cubicle mate, or your schoolmate, somebody that's sitting next to you at school. We believe that wherever God has placed us, that we are on to be we are to be on mission loving and serving wherever we are. So several years ago, we felt this calling that maybe we were supposed to adopt from another country. And it came prompted from a few things, but we felt that God was stirring something in us. And we actually spent significant time praying with Pastor Sean and his wife Amy and trying to decide, what is God doing in our family? What are we supposed to be doing? And, and God, for us, said, yes, that's important. It is, but I want you to do something closer to home. And I was like, I don't really want to do anything closer to home. It felt scarier to me. And he actually called us to do foster care for kids in our own community. There was a need much closer to home than we realized. And we realized that the church should be stepping in those spaces more than they were. I was scared out of my mind. You can ask anybody. I was like, no, I will do anything but that. For some reason, it just felt safer to engage with something that wasn't right in front of me, that didn't get all up in my business So the word used in Matthew 22 for neighbor is telling. It's placeion, which is from the root word for near or near to. So in other words, a neighbor is someone close by. Your neighbor is actually your neighbor. The loud gum chewer at work or in school. The dog poop lever down the road. The always late person to class. The people that are closest to you, that God's placed right in your life, right around you, those are your neighbors. 
So in Luke's account of this same exact conversation, one of those listening wanted Jesus to specify who his neighbor was. Like, tell me exactly so that I can look for a loophole so that I don't have to actually love certain people. That's what they were doing, right? Tell me exactly who I am so I'm off the hook for the rest of the people I want to know exactly. Like, fine, I guess I'll love people, but I want to make sure I fulfill the law and that that's the most important. Anybody else realize they're missing the point completely? Jesus' response is that this is where we get one of the most talked about and shared stories in the Bible, which is the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan just briefly Um, somebody's hurt laying on the road, and multiple people pass by this person. You would think that would help religious people and um, people that should be caring. They just pass on by and ignore him. And then somebody that shouldn't have stopped is actually the one that stops and cares for this person. And central to the idea of the Good Samaritan is that people were trying to get around caring for their neighbors by redefining who their neighbors were. And by focusing on current agendas and networks rather than dealing with the needs right in front of them, even if there was no previous relationship. So the heart of the answer that Jesus gave is that there is no one, no matter how different from you, who exempts you from the call to love your neighbor. There's nobody. That's our call. That's our purpose. And we can't get out of that. So we can't say everybody but this person. Obviously, Jesus had in mind for us to love more than just those closest to us, just the people around us. But don't you think that would include at least those people around us and closest to us? So regardless of where you are, you have the opportunity to be a good neighbor and to share the love of Jesus with those closest to you. That's at work and at school and wherever you are. Author Malcolm Gladwell in his book, Outliers, tells the story of this village in Rosetto, Pennsylvania. It's a town made up of, it's entirely people that came from the village of Rosetto, Valfatori in Italy. That's the whole village. And he was extremely intrigued because there was a really low incidence of disease in this community. And there was no um, coronary artery disease in anyone younger than 55, and there were like four medical researchers in the 60s that decided, we want to figure out what's going on here. Why are all these people healthy? What's, what's the big, you know, what's the secret? And in studying this phenomenon, they found out that these people's diets, diets weren't any better than anybody else's diets. They all ate the same things, but their connections to their neighbors were profound. And so they actually lived longer. I love how clearly science backs up the words of Jesus over and over again. Today we have more literature, more media programs and training for reaching others than any time in our history. But the church in America in most areas is declining. So while there are several reasons for this, I wonder if perhaps one of them is that we've simply just forgotten one of the most foundational parts of being the church. And that's when Jesus said to start with your neighbors and to start with those closest to you. So just imagine if God's people caught a vision for the most basic command that Jesus gave us. The second principle is the kindness principle. What does it mean to actually love our neighbors? Yes, we have to get close to people. We have to get uncomfortable and let them get all up in our space. But then how do we go about being kind and loving? Sometimes we just overlook the practical nature of it. What if the command was like your neighbor? What would you do to express like? Sometimes we get caught up on the word love. So that might be like an easier way to think about that. Kindness can be a ramp to loving them. So just start with, what does it look like to like my neighbor? Here's the bottom line. God is calling us to invest in our neighbors, to sacrifice for our neighbors when necessary, and ultimately to show the kindness of God to our neighbors. Romans 4, 2b says that God's kindness leads us to repentance. God's kindness draws us towards him. So, in our loving of others, we become closer to God. And sometimes I see a great irony in the church. 
many Christians, they jump to the great commandment, right? They, they, um, they jump the great commandment, and they just get right to the great commission. They say, I'm going to go make disciples, but they've neglected to actually build relationship and to love and to show kindness to their neighbors. They don't want to invest the energy in it. It's hard work, and it's uncomfortable, and it's not always fun. We want to get to the results, right? We don't always want to put in the work. And then we're surprised when strangers aren't interested in our message of hope because we haven't taken the time to actually build relationship with people. And so when we try to share with them about the gospel, they're like, well, I don't really know what you're talking about because I don't really know you. What are you talking about? You haven't shown me kindness or love. Why would I want to, you know, buy into what you're trying to sell me? So we have to do both to be effective. We have to show kindness to our neighbors even when it's not easy. Our neighbors at home, they they might play loud music late at night when our kids are trying to sleep or go too fast down the road or let their dogs poop. Nobody's done that locally, by the way. That's not like a knock on our current neighbors. Just saying, it happens a lot. Um, They might have very different political views than you. And they might make us feel like the only conversation they want to have with us is about that. And it can just be uncomfortable. Or in your workplace, you're just trying to avoid the person at, you know, the, in the break room because whatever they're intent on telling you is something completely opposite of what you believe. It can just be a pool of gossip where it's just a negative space and a toxic space. And it's like, how do you love these people? How do you keep loving these people? Or it could be for you if you're at school, and you've got kids that are using language that you're not comfortable with or doing stuff that doesn't seem really kind. And we're around these people every single day. <laughs> every single day. I have to be intentional about my kindness or the things that my neighbors do or the people closest to me. It will bother me. It will derail me. It will keep me from that goal of loving others so that I can love them the way that Jesus wants me to love them, so that they can find Jesus for themselves. So I've only created like one real garden in my life. I'm not really great at it, but it was with the help of a friend, and she was a part of this community garden co-op, and so she helped me put together a really beautiful garden at one point, and she showed me there was actual strategy in it. You can't, I mean, like you could just toss out seeds, and stuff sometimes grows that way, but if you want to be intentional about it, you kind of have to have a plan, and there's like big books on gardening, like people get really into it. Um, I love receiving the fruits of those labors, but I'm not really great at at the gardening part. Um, So there's two ways you can do a garden, right? You can plant seeds in the ground and be really intentional about it. Or you can just go down to the store and buy the plants that are kind of ready to go, right? They're already started. And then you can just stick those in the ground. And then once they're fully grown, do these things have anything different about them? Not really. But for the seeds, you have to wait. So the point is, there are no seedlings in the kingdom. You have to start with the seed and trust that when you can't see the progress, God's still working. Or as Jesus put it, you have to love your neighbor. We have to love our, love our neighbors regardless whether or not we see the fruit of our kindness. We could spend a long time loving those closest to us and never see the fruit of that. And we have to trust that the Holy Spirit is working in those people's lives just as it happens with us. So sometimes people can get sideways. Christians are kind to one another, or they try to establish relationships for the sole purpose of getting them to come to church, or for the sole purpose of trying to make a presentation of some sort to them. But we should be good neighbors to those who are proximate to us by just being kind because they are worth getting to know. People are worth getting to know. It, they matter. And it doesn't really matter what happens. You have to let that part go and just love people. They are made in the image of God, just as you are. And because that's what God's called us to do. So that means listening as much as you talk, maybe even more than you talk. It means letting the Holy Spirit do the work in the midst of your relationship. 
And that takes God's timing. And we have to be willing to wait. My parents are great examples of great neighbors. They're there. They have lived on their cul-de-sac since 1993. And other families have come and go, but they've stayed. And every new neighbor is greeted with cookies or some sort of baked good from my mom, who's an amazing baker. Um, and a note, my mom has spent the last several Easter's she will get up before the sun is up, and she puts filled Easter eggs in the front yards of all of her neighbors that have kids. And she would often have cookie decorating parties at her house with the neighbor kids. My parents have also been the people who um, are in charge of taking care of pets when other families are away. Or we had, they had a former neighbor that was diabetic and Often, my dad was the one called if there was an emergency in order to get some additional help. People know that they can count on my parents, but my parents don't do that so that they can get something out of it, or that that means that they're going to get them to come to some event at their church. They just do it because they're compelled to. They're compelled to love others because of the way Jesus has loved them. There's no agenda. They're just simply loving their neighbors. They're such a great example for that. They trust that the Holy Spirit is at work in the lives of the people around them, even when they can't see what's going on. Jesus tells us to love our neighbors as ourselves. So I want you to hone in on that word yourself. Self-care is a big buzzword right now, right? And the importance of it is actually real. But if we think about how much we love ourselves— or should love ourselves as Christ made us, then we should try to imagine what it would be like if we showered that love on our neighbors. What would it look like to give the attention and care and concern to our neighbors just as we hope to do that for ourselves? We don't lose ourselves in the process, we just extend ourselves. It's out of the overflow. American theologian Stanley Hauerwau says, to learn to love ourselves truthfully is not easy because we most often desire to love ourselves on our own terms. The challenge that Jesus presents by joining these commandments is to learn that one is loved by God so that one is thus able to love God and others. Such a love requires a lifetime of training in which we are given the opportunity to have our self-centeredness discovered, and overwhelmed. The big C church, the big church as a whole, should be modeling how to love our neighbors, right? The church should be good at that. And I love that the Church of the Nazarene, the global church, is really good at that. They have Nazarene Compassion and Ministries all over the globe and on the ground in different countries loving and serving their neighbors. And I love that LCC also continues to meet and love the neighbor's around here. We partner with schools like Mountain View, which is just down the road, and, and Milestones, and, and different ways that our church models how we are supposed to do that for us. But we can't get so comfortable in going, well, the church is doing such a good job at that, that we don't actually then apply that to ourselves. The past few months, uh, UPS has actually even used our, our um, parking lot to help sort their packages it's legit, apparently. Um, <laughs> but just other ways like that I've seen. I mean, we have somebody that makes their delicious food here. And we, this church is just so generous with its space. And that really should extend to us and how we then are the church outside of here. But it can't just be the church, right? The whole body of Christ. As we are out there living, breathing, moving beings of the church, we are an extension of this. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Pastor Sean said last week that we were created by love for love, and that includes loving our neighbors. The people around you matter immensely to God. Have you ever thought about how those two commands then are connected, how to love God and, and love people? We love God with everything within us because he first loved us. That is the only way we can love people like that. That's the only way I can love people like that. 
And if we look back at the story of the Good Samaritan, we see that Jesus is in the role of the Samaritan, a stranger who had no obligation whatsoever to help someone who could have been considered an enemy. Yet he stepped outside of his own rights and entered into our pain and gave his own life for us. And that's the heart of the gospel, that sometimes I just need to begin there and remember that, that people, when we say people matter to God, we're saying that you matter to God and that Jesus gave his life for you. And so we see that too in our neighbors. Jesus gave his life for them too. And as we get ready to kick off another year that again looks different than years past, right? What would it look like then to get really intentional about this command to love our neighbors and to really focus in on that? How can we connect our neighbors, whether they're at home or school or work, whatever our neighbors are, those closest to us, how can we really love them? So there are a few practical ways that we can do this. I always really like practical ways because it gives me something to work towards. We can reach out. That's just one simple way. Reach out to your neighbors and get connected. Look for ways to connect in the coming days. What does that look like? Well, it's really helpful if you know their first name. When you say, hi, that's great. But if you say, hi, Joe, that makes a difference. Just knowing somebody's first name. And if you don't already know them, then it's a good way, that's a good starting spot. But if you already know their name, then find out something else. Take the next step. Um, We've actually printed off some resources for you. I think several years ago, if you were here, you did a whole series on this. But This is, it says, who is my neighbor? And it has you in the middle. And then these other spaces are for you to write in the names of your neighbors. So if you can't fill that out at all, then your goal would be to work on that. So put this on your fridge. There's right here on the table here as you go. And then Francie's actually going to drop a link in um, the chat. And you can print off your own resource. It's free online. And this is just a good place to start. Get to know your neighbors. And then once you've got these filled out, start praying for them. Pray for them by name. And then, and this is something that you can leave up for a really long time, and you can start to write, like, prayer requests and things in. And the second would just be to invite. Invite somebody to church. Just invite somebody. Andy Stanley is a pastor and author, says there are three knots to be listening for. So when you're talking to your neighbor and you're getting to know people around you, listen for the fact that they're, they're not in church. So listen for that if they're not in church. Or if things are not going well, listen for that. And, and listen for, um, I wasn't prepared for. So something happened in their life that they weren't prepared for. Listening for those things are, are some good ways for you to kind of slip in that invitation. And it's not because we have something to sell or some kind of gimmick, but that we have been changed by the love of Jesus and we want people to experience that. Amen? I want my neighbors to know how much Jesus loves them. And so when they come here, I want them to feel that love of Jesus. And so I want to invite people into this because I think we have something really cool here. Specifically at LCC, I think we have something really awesome happening here. God is at work and I want people to experience that. So I want to invite people into this because I want them to know that they can experience the change that I've experienced and the community that we experience here together. So we need to invite people here. Who is God putting in your life that you need to be a good neighbor to? Is it your coworker, your neighbor, your school mate, whoever they are, learn their names, learn their names. God has a purpose for each person and God has a purpose for you no matter where you're at. Next week, Pastor Tim is actually going to be preaching about then being prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. Because while we do love without an agenda, we have to actually be ready when people go, so why are you this nice? (laughs) Why are you this kind? Why why do you have this optimistic outlook on life right now? They're going to ask questions and we better be ready to answer. So Pastor Tim's going to preach on that next week. We believe in the transforming power of the Holy Spirit.
And we believe that God is actively at work in us and in the lives of people around us. And so let's not be caught sleeping when somebody asks us to give them the reason for the hope that we have. And when you invite somebody, don't just say, come to church, say, come sit by me. I have a seat for you. I have a seat for you and I'm gonna save it. And you can come early most Sundays and get a burrito too. So before you go, we're gonna sing here in a second. Um, Before you go, grab one of these on your way out. There's lots. (laughs) Um, And get work, get to work on getting to know the names of your neighbors and praying for them. Again, you can print it off with the resource that Francie dropped in the chat. But let's just spend some time in this, uh, this weird space between Christmas and New Year. It's kind of a weird space. And, and focus in on, okay, God, what do you want me to do with my neighbors this next year? How can I strategically and intentionally plan to love those around me, even when it's hard and it's uncomfortable? How do I get close to them and, and move towards the stuff that's going on in their lives? Because I guarantee you, your neighbors have stuff going on even if you can't see it, even if they haven't talked to you about it yet. We all have stuff we're carrying, and so that means our neighbors too. So let's pray, um, and then you guys are dismissed and be safe out there today. God, thank you for, for bringing us together today and for just reminding us the importance of something so simple as loving our neighbors. Thank you um, for reminding me what it looks like to, to show up and to love those closest to me. And I pray this week as we uh, are intentional with our time and learning about those closest to us that you would just bring their mind, their names to our minds as we learn them and that we would pray for them and just start there. I pray that you would go with each of us today, God, and, and whatever we've got going on, keep us safe on the roads. And we're just thankful that we could gather and that we could be together today. We love you. In your name, amen. Hey, grab one of these before you leave. Merry Christmas. You know, it's Christmas until Epiphany, according to the church calendar. So we're going to say Merry Christmas for a while. Um, Have a good Sunday. Drive safe, and we will see you next week.